Well, good afternoon and welcome to another in our series of webinars for starting co-ops. This is Stuart Reed. I'm the executive director here at Food Co-op Initiative. And today we are proud to welcome Dane Meisler from the Capitost Insurance Company. Uh, somebody I've been working with for many years and I'm pleased that he can share his knowledge about insurance and answer your questions about what kind of insurance you need, when you need it, and uh, the kinds of coverage and things that are available. So we'll be getting started with that momentarily. Uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, the Blooming Prairie Foundation, the USDA's Rural Co-op Development Grant Program, and many others, including food co-ops like yourselves, that have made contributions to make our work possible. Thank you very much. Uh, the map in front of you shows uh, what was our operations sphere of operations uh, up until recently. It's a little out of date, but we can see that we have new co-ops opening all over the country. And uh, we, if you see lots of clusters near you, we encourage you to, to get in touch with some of your uh, friends that are also opening co-ops and work together. You can get in touch with us to find out more about that. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, virtually our staff. There we go. That's me on the left, uh, if you hadn't guessed. And Jacqueline Hanna, just starting full-time with us this week. And Mary Stens Wilburn, who is helping out today with taking your questions when you send them in. And uh, we are the three that will help answer your questions and try to guide you down the path toward opening your co-op. Next month, we will have another webinar. It's scheduled uh, July 16th. Uh, no, that's next month would be June, wouldn't it? June 16th at the same time. And we will be having Bonnie Hudspeth join us from the Monadnock Co-op. And also, she works now with the uh, Neighboring Food Co-op Association in New England. Uh, she'll be talking about her experience working as a project manager and getting the Monadnock Co-op up and running. And uh, some of the things you should be thinking about when you're hiring, supervising, and uh, working with a project manager for your project. So please join us next month for that. Logistics, just a little bit. Uh, if you've got questions, you can either in the chat line on the YouTube channel or you can send them by email to info at fci.coop. Mary will be monitoring those and forwarding them through to us. And uh, we will take most of the questions at the end, but uh, if there are some that are relevant during the presentation, we may, we may take a couple of them as well. So I think that without further ado, we're ready to introduce Dane. There's a smiling face, and I do encourage you to get in touch with them at Capitos uh, if you have additional questions afterward. They're very good. Dane, okay, take it away. All right. Thanks, Stuart, and appreciate uh, the opportunity here. Um, so a little background on us. Just we're, you know, we're the, the health food store program nationwide, ensuring, you know, a few thousand stores and close to about 150 co-ops right now. Um, so basically, I'm just here today to, to talk to you a little bit about what you can expect on all ends of the spectrum, both from right initially starting up to almost on the verge of opening your storefront. Um, so basically, the, uh, the first aspect that I'm sure has been drilled into your head at some point uh, is in regards to directors and officers insurance. Um, directors and officers is, you know, the very first aspect as soon as the board is formed. Um, it's basically a defense cost policy. It's, it's intended to cover the board of directors, which most of you are volunteers. Actually, all of the 150 plus co-ops we have nationwide, uh, all of the board members are volunteers. So it's intended to cover these volunteers for decisions rendered. Um, it's, it's an aspect to to get your own personal liabilities out of the question if there's a lawsuit against the co-op. Um, and there's no better time to start that than right when you form the board because most of the most important decisions that are being made are right as you guys form, from membership gathering to, you know, trying to secure the funding to picking your storefront. So um, directors and officers insurance, it, it runs for the length of time you keep the coverage in place. So we want you we want to encourage you to put it in place right as the board forms not only to uh, to secure uh, the proper coverage for all of the board members in the future 
but also for you guys right out of the gates. Uh, you might be sitting there and thinking, well, what if, you know, in three or four years I'm, I'm no longer serving on, you know, my co-op's board? Well, you probably still want to be covered if a lawsuit comes about because of a decision you made when you first formed the board. So that's kind of why we, we, we push it upon the co-ops right out of the gates, even though, you know, we understand, you know, from an asset standpoint and, a, you know, a fundraising standpoint, you know, funds are a little tight, but this is kind of a, a pretty imperative coverage. Um, and, and there's some other aspects to the policy that you'll you will look into for you once you get closer to the storefront opening. And you can see that on the slide. Uh, it's referred to as employment practices liability. Uh, for any of you guys that are that have GMs in place or already have any W-2 employees, the employment practices liability is a coverage that's added to the directors and officers. And what that is for is to cover against things like sexual harassment, wrongful termination, and discrimination. Um, another very imperative coverage, most notably when your storefront opens because you, you'll have a lot more employees and a lot more opportunity for risk in that aspect. Um, our program and, and several of the, the other programs nationwide for directors and officers, you can actually place the DNO coverage without the employment practices, or you can place them both together. Um, so it, there's several options once you get going. If, if you don't have any W-2 employees, we'd obviously recommend you just put the directors and officers into place to start because that's really all you need to cover. There's no employees to worry about. Um, the general liability, uh, you really don't have that big of a risk yet if you're just starting up, but you will as the time goes on. Some of you probably have already been getting harassed at some point um, from farmer's markets or your local church or your local library where you're holding meetings, and they want a quote-unquote certificate of liability. You'll probably hear that a thousand times over before you open your stores. Um, and, and this is what they're looking for. They're looking for general liability insurance, which indemnifies whoever the host is, whether it be, again, uh, you're having a board meet, uh, owner's meeting at the local church, or you're participating in member ga membership gathering at the local farmer's market. Um, so the general liability is another aspect that we'll, um, we'll look into. Um, so just some particulars again on, on the actual directors and officers insurance. Um, I just touched on a couple of these bulleted points. But again, it covers the, the current board members for their decisions rendered, but it's also going to cover future and past board members. Um, a lot of the times I'll get phone calls from specific you know, board members saying, well, we're not going to serve on the board unless there's coverage in place, and we also want to make sure we're always going to be covered by the co-op for the you know for our term for the length of time we were serving that's that's the intention of the policy to make sure that every board member that's ever served will always be covered and the only way to do that to secure that is to a purchase the insurance but b make sure it stays in place um, again it you know helps relieve the board members from their personal liabilities I, you know I couldn't imagine if I served on a board and I was volunteering my time that I my own personal liabilities would be called into question, i.e. my home or my business, you know, for volunteering my time. So that, that's why the DNO, it's going to help indemnify you personally. The limits for the policy, they start out at a million dollars. It doesn't get less than that. That is the industry standard. Um, we've seen several claims with our co-ops over the years. They can, they can range in height. Um, all of the st startup co-ops that we've written DNO for over the past 12 months, um, everybody secures just a million. I, I wouldn't recommend going any higher unless you're on the verge of opening the storefront and your assets and payrolls are, are, are you know, trending upwards. Um, then you could consider going up in increments of a million. But for the most part, you would look to see it right at a million. Um, the last few, again, that we've done, I would say... The annual premium ranges anywhere from about $750 to $1,000 per year for that $1 million limit. So that's just a little bit of budgeting to keep in mind. And I, I say it varies because it's, it's very state-specific, different rates, different taxes, different fees. So depending on where you are, you should see it fall right in within that line. For the, for the actual startups um, where your total assets are you know anywhere from – 50,000 to 500,000 or even less than 50,000. 
um, some of the highlights of our, our of the program that we have um, offers a zero dollar deductible. Um, you can go higher in deductible, but as a startup, it's really not going to have a, a change in um, a, a change in price. So you know, we just we kind of want to push the zero dollar deductible simply because if you do have an issue right out of the gates, we want you to uh, not have any out of pocket expense. Um, we touched on the employment practices already. Again, that's something. If you have further questions on it, it's, it's more geared towards when you have your employees and when your storefronts getting set to open. So, in order to ask or to, in order to get um, the directors and officers coverage, um, it's an insurance application. It, it, it's not a lengthy one. Um, it's a word document that you can simply fill right into the form, save it, email it directly back. We actually get the quotes for this. Uh, back the same day. So it's a very quick process. If you're considering it now or you're really looking to push forward with it, it's something that can get done within a day. So um, you know, if you're talking amongst yourselves at the board wondering how long it'll take you, it, it won't take long at all. Um, if if your co-op set to go and you actually have financials, a prof, uh, profit and loss statement or balance sheet, we would require those um, if you're not obviously at that point. Uh, pro forma budget if you have it would be great. And if you don't have anything at the time to, to supply, that's okay. We can still get the um, the quotes back to you just with the application. Uh, as soon as you look to move forward with the policy, it simply takes a board chair uh, signature, and we can issue the policies and get you back the policy the exact same day. Um, electronic copies are available, so we email those directly to you, and um, you can share it amongst the board for review. No payments required to issue a policy, so uh, you know simply just the signature and the policies in place that day. Okay, so the general liability is um, it's a little bit different. Um, it, there, there's two different aspects that you the routes you can go. Um, again, my examples before those are the types of examples you're going to see as far as why you're going to need general liability. Um, this first one on your first slide suggests if it's just for a specific event. So if you're getting calls from the farmer or you're going to participate in the farmer's market or you're having a, a board meeting and someone's requiring it of you, you can always go about it and purchase just an event liability policy. Um, it's usually the more costly option. It starts at about $250 per event. So you can see in terms of just comparing it to the directors and officers, if you have a, three or four events, you're you've already spent as much as you would for an entire year's worth of D&O insurance. So this isn't the option we recommend. It's just an option. It, it's it, it could be the only option for you. Um, on the next slide, it, we talk about why um, why that is, why it's more costly. And and the other option that we always recommend to our startup co-ops is trying to secure a business owner's policy. A business owner's policy is the, the actual policy you're going to have in place when your storefront opens. It's going to cover the, the property at a premises. It's going to cover general liability at a premises from slipping and falling to fire liability. Um, so it's actually the exact same policy you'll need when you open the storefront. But we can secure a business owner's policy for you if you actually have an office space or a smaller storefront where the co-op is operating out of. And with this business owner's policy, most of the insurance carriers that, that we would issue a policy with, they'll allow you these certain events. Um, they'll extend the general liability for you. Um, so, for example, we issue this business owner's policy on your behalf. You, you've got a 500-square-foot office space. So you reach out to us and say we're going to participate in the local farmer's market they're requiring you know us to show them proof of coverage we would you know send in a request to the business owners policy insurance company and say you know we we'd like to extend the coverage for this one day event they would ask us some particular questions and they would extend coverage for most cases in terms of risk um, as you can see in the cap locks not all events will be covered so I can't make that blanketed statement but Certain things in our certain experience, uh, such as the farmers markets, board meetings, membership gathering events, those types of things will be extended coverage. It's it's when you get into certain higher risk events, you know, where there's a, a rock climbing wall and a bounce house for the kids and 
perhaps they're serving you know beer and wine at the event that's when you can actually find yourself with the insurance company not willing to afford the coverage and which is understandable because the risk is going up but this is the more cost effective effective option we can we can actually place business owners policies starting anywhere from five hundred dollars for the year and that would give us a one million dollar general liability limit which is what would be required of you in most cases. Um, we just did one um, for a co-op in Illinois, the Food Shed Co-op. Um, they, they teetered back and forth for several weeks um, about purchasing event policies or obtaining a business owner's, and they ended up settling on being able to lease or rent uh, a small little three or four hundred square foot retail office space. Policy was five hundred dollars for the year. They've already had a couple events where they're. Uh, where the, the policy was able to extend the coverage. So it, just in terms of comparison, they've already saved money um, in, in terms of not having to take the event liability policy, which could cost $250 per event. So something to keep in mind, something to think about, um, if you can, if you have the ability to, to rent or lease an office space at a better cost, you know, perhaps you can work something out. I've seen some co-ops use their local church or, you know, uh, friends of the board where they, you know, lease lease them some office space for a cheaper margin. Um, this could be the, the best possible scenario for you. Something we'll, we'll talk about and discuss once you, you, know, you approach it. Uh, but again, more, most cost-effective option in terms of securing general liability. Okay, so those are the two types of policies for the, the, uh, the immediate uh, startups. You know, just getting your board together, just starting the membership uh, gather, just starting the fundraise. Um, the policies you see on the slide now are, are much more geared towards you've got your storefront picked out. You're, everything's progressing along you know, beautifully. You've got your storefront and you know, now what is our risk? What, what types of policies do we need? So I've listed the, the, the types of policies here for you. Um, builders risk insurance, business owners policy you see again as I mentioned, uh, commercial umbrella, workers' compensation, commercial auto, and employment practices liability, which we touched on with the directors and officers. So the first one, the builder's risk insurance, some of you who um, possibly are, are already in the middle of their storefront and doing a build-out or a renovation, um, I would say more times than not, and Stuart will be able to back this up, you guys are going to be doing renovations, whether minor, whether major, whether a, a full build-out. Um, so the type of insurance that you need in place when you're doing the renovation is referred to as a builder's risk insurance policy. The general contractor might be carrying this for you. Um, the landlord or the owner of the building might be carrying this for you. But in our experience, they usually require uh, whoever's occupying the space or will be occupying the space to carry the builder's risk coverage. The reason for it is plain and simple. It covers renovations. It covers a build-out. Um, that's why they named it appropriately so. Uh, the business owner's policy that we just discussed for your office space or when you actually open your doors to the, to the public, it specifically excludes renovations. Um, so it's actually a policy that can't be placed when you're doing a renovation. A lot of times you'll be instructed otherwise and, and someone will say, yeah, let's go ahead. We can get our business owner's policy right up right away. We'll get it in place. We have a six-month uh, renovation project. Well, every single insurance policy on a, a business owner's, um, it specifically excludes renovations. So you don't want to run into a situation where you're paying for a policy, but it's it's not going to work the way you, you intended it to work. So just keep in mind, if you get close to a point where you start talking to contractors and, you know, renovations are, are – definitely going to take place, a builder's risk policy is going to be what you need. Um, the types of information we need is the general contractor's information. A certificate from the general contractor is actually required to sec secure this type of policy. Um, and, and, and general contractors are, are very much in tune to this. They know they need to provide the certificate. Similar to what we just talked about for your events, people requiring certificates of you you'll be requiring a certificate of your general contractor. There's an application process for it. Um, it's, a, again, a pretty simple process. It's actually only a page um, mostly geared towards, you know, what the cost of your project's going to be, the length of time, um, 
a general description of, of what's going to take place during the renovation. Are you going to be, you know, breaking down load-bearing walls? Are you going to be painting, electric, plumbing? Um, so it's basically just looking for some general knowledge of, of the renovation itself. And unlike most other insurance policies, it's actually written on shorter terms. So if it's only a three-month, six-month, nine-month renovation, that's actually how long they can write the policy for. So you don't have to get locked into a full year policy if your project's only going to take six months. So that in turn helps make make it a little bit more cost effective. Um, but this is something that if you, your lenders are going to, you'll hear this language down the road. Your lenders are going to require builder's risk insurance. Um, and it's something you want to talk about now if you're already in the works for picking out your storefront and you know renovations are going to take place. Something to budget for. So the business owner's policy we touched on um, in regards to if you have an office space. Well, it's the same policy for your storefront. It's covering everything soup to nuts. It's, it is your the nuts and bolts of your day-to-day -day operations. It's covering customers coming in, slipping and falling, chipping their tooth. Uh, someone gets sick from a product and wants to sue the co-op. Um, so every general liability aspect is covered under this business owner's as well as property coverage. So your inventory in the store, your walk-in coolers, refrigeration units, produce cases, your POS systems, um, every, every piece of property you own in there. The best way to look at it is at, at some point, if the insurance company had to replace everything inside of the store, what would it cost them to do so? And that's, that, that's going to be your property coverage on the business owner's policy. Um, there's several enhancements that we have on our exclusive program for the co-ops um, that I just put in here to touch on some aspects to think about. Again, this it's way down the road for, for several of you, um, but any of you that are, are close to opening doors or in renovation process, aspects to think about um, when you are picking your business owner's policy. You know, covering for things like power interruptions, um, loss of business because the power went out. You know, in Hur when Hurricane Sandy hit, we probably had, you know, close to 100 stores on the East Coast um, all affected by it. You know, they were without power for several days. They lost their product due to being without power, but they also lost, you know, several thousands of dollars in sales. You know, it's a, it's a very important aspect. Um, Spoilage coverage, of course, is is will be your main point of coverage as a, as a retail grocery shop. Um, you know, you're going to lose product. Power is going to go out. You know, equipment is going to break down. Compressors are going to go. go. Uh, our our program offers paying these these coverages out at retail selling price, um, but it's 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 just a very imperative coverage that we don't go a whole day with our program without having one of these claims. Private labeling coverage, um, something maybe you are uh, talking about um, or when you're get, getting closer to open, you'll be considering um, putting your co-op's name on your own products. Um, it's a very big growing trend. Um, if you've gone to any of the trade shows, Expo West, Expo East, um, or anywhere in between, um, I would, uh, you know, private labeling is something you're going to want to talk about and consider. Plenty of other, you know, coverage enhancements. Again, down the road, you'll you'll see and talk about. Um, quotes don't take long at all. A few days. Um, as far as premium gauging, can't really give you any ballparks. Policies start at 500, as I mentioned, and they can, you know, wide range depending on the size of your building, to the construction of your building, to how much property you're going to cover inside. So you'll get a better gist of, you know, your actual cost for this policy once you, you have more information on the storefront itself. A commercial umbrella policy, um, that's something that, you know, is in addition to the business owners. It's an additional amount of liability. So, um, again, it, it, it's something when the storefront is open, if you consider yourself, your co-op, maybe in a higher risk hazard city um, where slip and falls are, you know, it, a growing trend. Um, you might want to consider umbrella insurance at the time. Um, again, it's it's literally just to give an additional amount of insurance above and beyond what you're currently carrying. Um, umbrella limits range from a million all the way up to five million. Something that's usually quoted 
as soon as you have a business owner's policy quote, an umbrella policy is usually quoted with it as well. Workers' compensation insurance, um, you will need it. Um, as soon as you have a W-2 employee, you will need to implement it. Depending on state, it's very state specific, but um, I've worked with so many startups that even currently right now they have GMs or an outreach manager in place and they're still not carrying workers' comp. Um, not to intend to scare anyone, but you can be fined by the state that you're in, the Workers' Comp Labor Bureau, if you're carrying a W-2 employee as an entity and you're not carrying workers' comp for that said employee. Again, that's state-specific. There are only a few states nationwide where you're not required to carry workers' comp. So, um, again, it'll be case by case, but the second the co-op hires a W-2 employee is, is the very second you want workers' compensation in place. Even though you might not have a storefront, the GM or the outreach may be working from home. Um, that's perfectly fine. The workers' comp policy can be written as such um, so that we, the location is actually specific to the employee and their home address. Uh, very easy from a quoting standpoint, a logistics standpoint, not as many moving parts as the business owner's policy. Very cut and dry. We're covering your employees for their job descriptions. While they're there, while they're working, um, they're going to be covered. The employees are, are placed into classifications. As you can see, I put a, just a couple examples of the classifications that we see on the day-to-day -day for our co-ops. Um, grocery retail employees, clerical office employees, and then for possibly some of you larger co-ops, um, you could be put into a supermarket class code. That's kind of uh, contingent on if you have a lot of deli activity, meat cutting, and, and more produce than just a regular grocery. Um, but those are some things to consider. Um, the rates vary state to state, um, and they, they vary insurance company to insurance company. So we competitively would market it to as many insurance companies as we can to see who has the best rate in your specific state. Very basic information to, to obtain the quote. Um, your federal tax ID number is imperative. We actually cannot quote without it. Um, the employee count, full-time and part-time. Uh, the classifications, as I just mentioned, which we would help you kind of piece it together if it's your first time trying to, to classify your employees. And then the estimated payroll for these employees. Um, workers' comp is based on an estimation. It's the only way they can do it. Um, so basically, if you were to estimate 50000 in payroll for your employees for the year, at the end of the policy year, you would end up doing an audit with the insurance company. And at the end of the audit, if you ended up paying more than 50000 in payroll, you would pay an additional amount. Vice versa, if you paid less than 50000 out, you would get a reimbursement from the, from the insurance company. Just like good old Uncle Sam works the same way. Um, Quote, quotes for workers' comp are the most simplistic out of all. Uh, workers' comp is quoted same day, can be issued the same day. So for anybody that may have just hired a GM or had one in place, um, where I was giving you that reasoning before to get it in place, it's something that can get done right away. Uh, commercial auto, uh, it, this this won't be for everybody, um, but it's, it's a topic that we like to talk about a little bit. Um, not a lot of our co-ops have... Um, a commercial vehicle, a van, or anything where they'll be doing deliveries. So, um, you know, it's it's this won't be important for everybody. But if you are planning to do deliveries, or you are going to have a van or or something that will be in the company's name, we do have to secure a commercial auto policy. Um, again, pretty simple information. We just need the info on the vehicle itself, the year, make, and model, and the VIN number of the vehicle, and then a driver's list. Who's going to be doing the driving? Um, We'll need to know their date of birth, driver's license number, um, and and then as far as if you are going to be doing deliveries on behalf of the co-op, about how far you'll be going. Um, again, won't be for everybody, but um, something to consider if you do plan on doing de uh, deliveries. Uh, just to follow up on the employment practices liability, it, it, this is one of the growing um, coverages in our industry. Um, we've actually seen a, a substantial spike in the past two years um, with our co-ops in particular. Um, just a great deal of wrongful termination uh, claims that we've seen. Not so much on the discrimination or sexual harassment 
side, but wrongful termination has spiked up um, dramatically actually over the past couple years. So this is a coverage that we actually find imperative. The second that you you know really start doing your hiring, you know we'd implore you to put this on your DNO policy, um, specifically for wrongful termination alone. Um, you know we find that our co-ops are, are some of the best employers in the country, but it's not going to, you know, deter a rogue employee from following suit against the co-op because they they feel that they were, you know, let go uh, <laughs> improperly. So it's something that again gets added right to the DNO policy. If you have DNO in place, uh, it's it's a very simple, uh, you know, process. You literally just call and say, "I want to add EPLI." Um, you'd give us your employee count, and we'd send it right to your DNO company and they'd add it the same day for you. It would take the same limit you had with the DNO, which again starts at a, a $1 million industry standard limit, and you can go up from there all the way up to $5 million. And uh, just a little blurb on, on our program in general. I mean, we've been, we've been catering to the health food store program and, and cooperatives specifically, as Stuart mentioned, for several years. Um, close to about 150 co-ops, as I said, uh, nationwide. Um, if I can ever offer any references, kind of like Stuart said, to reach out to anybody that we've insured for lengths of time anywhere in the country, just let us know, any GMs, any, you know, financial managers, board chairs, uh, we'd be more than happy to, you know, just give a reference to talk from an insurance perspective as well. Um, you know, we cater directly to this industry, we do all different types of insurance, um, but for the most part our day-to-day -day talk revol revolves around this industry. So anything that we can be of help on, um, please feel free, check, um, check out our website, um, my contact information was on the slides and let me know when I can help. Thanks, Dane. That was great. Um, I learned a lot and uh, I thought I knew all about insurance, so good job. We have a couple of good questions here for you. Uh, okay. Let's start out with this one. Uh, with the uh, liability policy, the general business policy, do they generally cover things like uh, the Acts of God stuff, the, the earthquakes and floods, uh, or do you have to have special coverage to for that sort of thing? Yeah, a good question, Stuart. No, they, they don't. Um, when you talk about, anytime you want to talk about insurance and you think of catastrophes, those are, they're, it's its own separate horse. Um, when it, an earthquake policy, you have to secure an earthquake policy. Flood policy is actually written through the federal government now, uh, post-Hurricane Sandy, um, through the National Flood Insurance Program. So when, you, when you're talking catastrophes or named periled catastrophes, i.e. a hurricane of that nature, um, that type of thing usually requires its own insurance. Now, with a hurricane, that's more wind-related damage, and a, um, a business owner's policy would cover wind or hail and things of that nature, but flood and earthquake they do not. You can secure, uh, you know, policies, and there are some insurance markets who will add those specific coverages to their business owners. But for the most part, you'd have to go out and purchase those coverages separately. Okay, great. Uh, another one on uh, volunteer workers. I mean, as we mentioned, you mentioned the the board is typically volunteer during the time before the store opens and often ongoing, uh, and they're covered by DNO. But what about anybody that's working in a more operational capacity, either helping with the startup or, in the case of a few stores that still have uh, volunteer member programs, are they covered by your other policies, or does it require something special? Yes, um, and in fact, I know it's been a big growing topic around listservs and different co-ops uh, around the country because I've, I've gotten more calls on volunteer uh, insurance coverage over the past couple weeks than I have in a few years. One thing that you mentioned, Stuart, that I want all the board members uh, that are listening to, to understand, the DNO insurance isn't covering you from any particular general liability infraction. So think of DNO and general liability as two completely separate types of insurance altogether. The DNO policy is covering the, the volunteer board members from a professional standpoint. So again, boiling back to decisions rendered, that's what the DNO is entitled for. Not certain things like slipping and falling or, or something like that on a particular premises. Where the volunteer members and, and 
a lot of you co-ops who are going to have the volunteer working members, the one key thing to, to understand is that work there, there is no workers' comp for volunteer members. And, and they're basically on the premises, and at any one, one given time, if they were to slip and fall or they were to hurt themselves while working, there would be no workers' comp to pay out disability or pay out you know uh, medical benefits. Um, that particular working volunteer member could actually sue the co-op under the general liability. Knock on wood, in all the years we haven't had one of those yet because um, we like to think of it as if the owner member is volunteering their time and, and working for their own co-op, their own business, they actually wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't sue their own business. So we haven't seen one of those yet. Uh, one thing we were able to track down probably about three or four years ago now is, is a policy that's referred to as a volunteer um, medical expense policy. Um, it is not workers' comp. We don't promote it that it is. It's nowhere near as substantial as workers' comp. But what this policy gives is some medical expense relief to vo the volunteer members. So, for instance, um, Jacqueline, who I know is listening in at Common Ground, they, they have this particular policy in place where, um, you know, their working members, if they were to get injured there and they didn't have their own medical insurance, you know, and it was a pretty significant type of, you know, a claim or a significant injury, this volunteer workers or this volunteer disability medical policy could kick in. Um, we actually we write the policies up to a twenty five thousand dollar max limit, so it's it's a good amount of coverage. Um, but again, it's nowhere near in, in, intended to act as workers comp, but it does give the co ops a little bit of relief in that regard. We have not found anything for our our you know co ops that use volunteer members, and nor has any other agent nationwide who we've actually spoken to and different expos and trade shows and things. So we do recommend putting this in place if you are going to have working members. Um, premiums are actually very inexpensive. Um, they range from, I believe, $250 to about $350 for the year. So it's not a huge incurred cost. And again, it, it does at least give some relief in case the co-op does need some medical uh, you know, payment benefits. Great. That's that's a question we get a lot as well. So I'm glad we had a chance to address that. Um, Mary, you got anything else coming in? It looks like we we don't have any any more right now. Your last chance here to get a chance to ask Dan a question. Uh, I'll just while we're waiting here, I'll let you know that uh, as always, this webinar is recorded and will be available uh, uh, from through our YouTube site and linked from our website. It usually gets posted the same afternoon or very shortly, so watch for that. And uh, if people in your organization didn't get a chance to see it, they'll have another opportunity. Uh, also, uh, once again, we hope you can join us next month for an insider's look at project management. And uh, seeing that, uh, any parting comments from you, Dane? No, I appreciate the time. I, I think, you know, a lot of general information on the slides themselves, so. Questions will pop up all the time, and I know, Stuart, you're there to be able to answer those, but if I can be of any help, just shoot me a direct email, give me a call, and let me know what your – every co-op's unique and different, so there's different challenges that come up along the way. Let me know when I can help. All right, great. Thanks again, and thanks to uh, Mary and Joel for their help in the background, and uh, that's all for today, folks. Uh, good luck with your co-ops, and stay in touch. <laughs>